I had a friend named Bill, uh, and I got to know Bill pretty well and his wife uh, and his two kids. Uh, and uh, as I got to know Bill, I remember thinking one day that uh, if you lined up everybody in our city from the most likely to become a Christian to the very least likely to become a Christian, Bill would have been at the very end of the line. Uh, it just seemed to me like there was everything against him. He was just encased in his, his doubt and unbelief and, and rebellion. And yet, how surprised was I when he became a Christian? Um, you know, the Apostle Paul is like this. If you'd lined up everybody uh, 2,000 years ago after the resurrection, uh, Saul of Tarsus would have been at the end of the line, and yet he becomes a Christian. Part of the connections, as we're talking about connecting in church, is that our task is to connect with people outside of the four walls of this church. People, some of whom you would think would never be interested in becoming a Christian. Uh, we're going to meet a fellow like that today uh, in the Bible, uh, the most unlikeliest of Christians uh, who became a Christian. His name is Zacchaeus. Um, Zacchaeus was a man who was very wealthy, uh, but unfortunately got his wealth through uh, being a shyster. He was a tax collector uh, for the Roman government. And back during those days, uh, Rome didn't care uh, how you collected taxes as long as you brought in your quota. And so this set up uh, the, the possibility of corruption and uh, extortion uh, because all the cards were in the power of the government and the little guy who was paying taxes had no power at all. But even though he was a wealthy man outwardly, uh, it came at a great cost to him inwardly. He was a, he's a man with an impoverished soul. He put on a good front outwardly. He had everything he thought it would take to make him happy, and uh, he probably assumed that everybody thought that of him. But inwardly, it's a different story was being told. Uh, he had no deep connections in his life, though I'm sure there are people that said hi to him or maybe nodded to him out in, out in, in the street in Jericho there. Nobody really liked him. And that sense of just disconnection inside of his heart just continued to grow. We call it loneliness and emptiness. Our story begins in Luke 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. I already mentioned that he was a tax collector. And so in that particular Jewish culture... <laughs> These guys were seen as sort of the bottom of the barrel. Uh, he would have been somebody who was, was shunned, maybe, maybe some politely, but, but nobody really wanted to be around this guy. Uh, disdain was usually around him. And, and it says, Luke says he was wealthy, uh, so he had a lot of money, but the reason he had a lot of money was because of, for nefarious reasons. But he had double shunning going on here. And Luke records in this verse that he was not just a tax collector, but the chief tax collector. He was like the head of the office in this particular uh, part of the, of the, of the uh, Roman uh, Empire. Uh, the uh, word there for chief tax collector is a compound word. And chief comes from the prefix of this compound word, which is the Greek word arch. Uh, it's, we uh, spell it A-R-C-H, uh, arch. The uh, sort of like the arch enemy, sort of like this is the arch tax collector here. Um, and this is this is the fellow that we're meeting here. Uh, the story continues in verse three, and we start to get a picture of how God reaches somebody like this. And grace is expressed through initiative. Or you might want to think more specifically, grace is expressed through invitation. Through invitation. Verse three. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. Now, what's going on is Jesus was on his way to Jericho. He had just healed the blind man outside the city, and this created a huge buzz. People were coming from their, their shops and their houses out to the main street as Jesus and his disciples were approaching. And from the countryside, people were coming in to see this amazing thing that had happened. And we're not told the detail of how big the crowd is. But it's big enough that a, a short man like Zacchaeus can't see over the people in front of him. I imagine the streets lined with five, six, ten deep, and poor Zacchaeus can't see. When I was a kid, uh, we lived in New Orleans and went to Mardi Gras. 
And I remember being in third grade and everybody's standing as the, as the floats come by and the candy is for it. And my poor father had three of us little ones, a third grader, a second grader, and about a three-year-old. And the, for hours, he just rotated, taking one of us and putting them up on his shoulders uh, so that we could see what was going on. Well, that's sort of how Zacchaeus is here. He, he could not see because he was short because of the crowd. Now, if you and I were there and we had seen Zacchaeus and knew him to be the scoundrel, the extortionist that he was, we would have probably put him last in line of the most interest, the least interested in finding out something about the gospel and who Jesus is. And probably everybody in that community would have thought the same thing. And yet, in this particular instance, there is some interest that he has in wanting to at least see who Jesus is. Verse 4. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, it's interesting what happens here. In that culture, Middle Eastern culture back then, as well as today, one of the highest values in that culture is honor. Uh, and sometimes that's, uh, that's used for good reasons, and sometimes that value is held up for terrible reasons. But the honor here in this culture would have been something like this. Zacchaeus, who was a wealthy man, goes to a tree and climbs up the tree so that he can see Jesus. Now, what, would, what would that mean for today? It would mean somebody who uh, works for the mob or um, uh, a CEO who's very wealthy, climbing up in the tree in his $2,000 three-piece suit to see who Jesus is. That would have created all kinds of, um, what's going on here? What, what is, I, I don't get this. He climbed up the sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Now, in that culture back then, if a rabbi or somebody famous was coming through, uh, it was not unusual to sort of invite yourself over to somebody's house to spend a, a meal or uh, the day. Uh, you know, that would be rude in our culture. But it would be an honorable thing for the person, the host, in this case, Zacchaeus, for that to happen. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. Now, Luke records just some simple things here. Did Jesus know Zacchaeus prior to this? We're not told. We are told that he called him by name. And we are told about the response uh, that he wanted to be at his house. The power of invitation and we are told about his, his response. He came down immediately. Jesus came down, Zacchaeus came down immediately and said, I must stay at your house. The power of invitation is expressed through, uh, through grace is expressed through initiative, or you might think more specifically about invitation. But also grace is expressed through love and connection. Love and connection. Or more specifically, kindness. Initiative or invitation and kindness. Invitation and kindness. Invitation and kindness. Verse 6, he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Now, he's probably flattered and enjoyed. At least somebody wanted his company. Uh, but then a second buzz was created, not just about Jesus and the healing, but in verse 7, all the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. And here we see something. You know, why would Luke uh, tell us about this? There are three things he tells us that are, that are important details. All the people, when they saw this, that big crowd of people, there was this collective groan, like, oh. And they began to mutter, mumble grumble, that under the breath, critical spirit that comes out. And they say he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, we're going to come back to this in a few moments. Uh, as the story goes on, grace can be felt by someone who hasn't experienced it. Uh, Zacchaeus has not experienced grace until probably in his life until this moment. He gets a little taste of it as he's in the tree and he's invited and he, and he experiences something of kindness. Now, 
it's interesting to me that uh, what if uh, you were, uh, if Mother Teresa was alive and she came to our city and she came to you and called you by name and said she wanted to have lunch with you. And so maybe it's lunch at your house, like here. And she comes over inside and outside in front you have ABC News and NBC News and CBS News and you have the satellites, you know, the, the big things pointing up towards the satellites and reporters are there. And everybody's wondering why she chose you. Imagine yourself at your dining room table and you're sitting across from Mother Teresa. Now what goes on inside of you? I think two things go inside of probably all of us. One is you're sort of flattered that she's there to talk to you. And you're interested in what she has to say and you're sort of wowed by her character. But at the second time, there's probably some element of fear that goes on inside of us. You sort of begin to compare yourself with Mother Teresa and come up quite short. Maybe you think about how you treated your wife or your husband last week or, or yelling at your teenage child. Or maybe like in Zacchaeus' case, you think about your business dealings or financial dealings. Uh, and there's something of shame and hiding that's going on at the same time. Now, one of the puzzling things about this passage is that we are not told one detail about the conversation that happens in the home of Zacchaeus. But we are told the effect of the conversation that happens in here. Verse 8, the very next verse says, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, this is kind of annoying. I want to know, what did Jesus tell him at lunch? I think that would help me as I'm trying to share my faith with, with lost friends I know. Did he share the gospel with him? We're not told. Did he say to Zacchaeus, the cross is coming, and when you see me hang on a cross, remember this day, and there's something that's going to happen there. We're not told that he said that. Did he confront him about being a tax collector and a cheat? We're not told that. Did he confront him about extortion and about evil and wickedness? We're not told about that. We're not told about anything of... of not one word of the conversation. Now, when something like that happens in a Bible story, I am always struck by this. Is the Bible answering questions that I'm not asking? Am I asking questions that the Bible's not answering? This is one of those great stories where I am asking questions that the Bible gives me no answers to. What did Jesus say at that lunch? But this passage is answering questions that we should be asking. And the question is, how did grace impact this man to where conversion happens? And, and a wild, full, amazing conversion happens. Lord, I will give half of my possessions to the poor. Think about if you were Zacchaeus. And you said to the Lord, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. Okay, well, we have two cars. I'm going to get rid of one of them. Uh, we have a house that's too big for just the two of us. Maybe we need to sell it and buy something smaller and give away half of the equity. We have too much furniture. Maybe we need to get rid of some of our, the extra furniture, half the furniture we have. Maybe I have too many shirts in my closet. I'll give half of my shirts away. Maybe I have too many pairs of slacks. I'll give half of those away. Maybe I have too many pairs of shoes. Now you start to think about this. You think, wow, Zacchaeus. What happened to Zacchaeus? And what happened to Zacchaeus was the wonder of grace. Something became more important to him. He tasted than everything that had happened. Now, how did that happen? We aren't told about anything in a conversation, but the Holy Spirit does shine a light on what was most important, and there are verses we already read. What do we know? Jesus, on one hand, stopped 
and looked up to Zacchaeus in the midst of that whole crowd, called him by name and invited himself with something coming out of his heart that Zacchaeus felt as kindness. And we are told that when he did that over here, the crowd muttered, all the people muttered and said, he is going over to the, Jesus is going over to the home of a sinner. Now, the Holy Spirit does give us that information. And it is a tremendous contrast. Now, what is he saying? What's the contrast? On one hand, there is tremendous contempt that Zacchaeus had felt from the people, not just then, but as a part of his life. And the contrast is amazing kindness that, that he's experienced in that episode with the tree and probably continued to experience at lunch. Now, what makes this even more amazing is that the contempt that the crowd had was deserved. Zacchaeus had this coming. The kindness that he experienced from Jesus was undeserved. The contempt was expected. You know, what did you expect? You live this way, this is what you get. The kindness that was given to Jesus was unexpected. The more that kindness is experienced as something coming out of the human heart that affects our attitude and words, the more powerful the kindness is felt. The more undeserved the kindness appears, the more powerful the kindness is felt. In this particular case, both of these things are at work. The contempt uh, and the kindness are both uh, expected and unexpected, deserved and undeserved. Something powerful happens inside of Zacchaeus, which we call grace. Yeah, he's saved. He becomes saved. Titus 3, 5 is kind of the, the verse, one of the favorite verses that Christians use uh, describing salvation by grace. He saved us, not because of deeds done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly, so that being justified by his grace... If you try to share your faith with people, Titus 3, 5 is a great verse to, to know and to be able to point people to. But what we often forget is the context for verse 5 is verse 3 and 4 that comes directly before this. Titus 3, 3 says, For we, we also once were foolish ourselves, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, uh, being, uh, following evil desires, uh, being hateful and hateful, um, contempt for one another. But notice what he says in verse four, when the kindness and love of God, our savior appeared, then the famous verse five, he saved us, not because of, of deeds we have done. When the kindness and love of God appeared, then he saved us. Now, this is what's happening with, in this particular case, in Luke 19 with Zacchaeus. What he experienced was kindness. It's the Greek word krestos, which can be translated kindness or something that is gracious or pleasant. Describing an attitude that is felt. What Zacchaeus experienced, he experienced kindness, which opened up his heart to hear the gospel. Luke 6.35 has the same idea. Jesus says, Be, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back then your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High because he is kind. Same Greek word. He is krestos. He is kind to who? The deserving? The undeserving. He is kind, krestos, to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. But what happens? Grace is felt by Zacchaeus beginning in that little episode with the tree. The kindness of Jesus for him, even though it was completely undeserved, the kindness undeserved, unexpected, carries through to the point where grace has its ability to melt his heart and repentance and faith happened. He becomes saved. And that is seen in his being willing to give up half of what he has and to repay those he's cheated four times back. 
Verse 19, grace brings salvation. Today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. When Jesus hears him with his repentance and wanting to give half of what he had away and four times as much restitution, the obvious conclusion to Jesus' is salvation has come. Now notice how he puts this. Not that he earned salvation or he thought, this is the day I'm going to get saved. It's like Jesus says, you know, salvation is started way out there in eternity with my father. And I came with what we call Christmas. And grace has been offered to people all down through the course of history. And it has come to this man in this place, in Jericho, in his home, to somebody completely undeserving. And he calls him, he's the son of Abraham, which would have been a shock to all the Jewish people in Jericho because Abraham is the poster child of being saved by faith, not by works. To call this man who'd been a scoundrel saved would have been amazing. Now, as I think about this and trying to share my faith with, with uh, my lost friends, there are several things that strike me as very simple. That we usually make this much more difficult uh, in our heads, and so we hardly ever get started on this. Before Zacchaeus invited Jesus, as we would say, into his heart, Jesus had invited himself into Zacchaeus' life. We have a little picture of that with the sycamore tree, and going to spend time with him, to be with him over lunch. Not going to do a Bible study, although Bible study is fine. He's going to be with him. He's going to connect with him. And what Zacchaeus experiences is the wonder of grace and kindness felt through Jesus. Uh, Jesus finishes this with a challenge to all of us as Christians. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Came to seek and to save what was lost. Now, as Christians, we think, well, what, what do I bring to the table here? that can make that happen. And you usually think, do I know enough of the Bible? Am I gonna be able to answer difficult questions? What, what if somebody calls me a bad name or, or gives me an excuse and, and I just sat, stand there like, uh, just I don't know. That's usually what we think. Uh, but what we, what we bring to the table are two things that already lie within us if you're a Christian. The first is the heart of Jesus that is invitational. Just like he had done with Zacchaeus in the tree and with uh, the following lunch. You don't have to ramp that up from somewhere. That's our, the, if you're a Christian, the heart of Jesus is the invitational love of Jesus. It's, it's exactly what at the verses Adam shared this morning, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened down. It's the invitational love of Christ. And the second thing you have to give if you're a Christian is the kindness of Christ that also resides in the heart of every Christian as a fruit of the Spirit. Those are the two big things that Jesus brought to the table here. They were the two great things through which grace had a chance to be felt and experienced and finally to come home in, in the heart of Zacchaeus. And this is our starting place with your lost friends, even the people in your mind that are at the very end of the line. Kindness and invitation. 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 Now, you say, well, I, you know, Seth, I'm not a Christian. I, I don't pretend to be. I'm not. I'm kind of checking this thing out kind of like Zacchaeus. And one of the things that may be an encouragement to you as you're trying to figure out this whole Christianity thing and the Bible thing is you may be making this a lot more difficult than it needs need be as well. The stunning thing about Zacchaeus, and it can be true for you as well, if you are willing to come down from your tree, Jesus is willing to come in. Usually our tree has to do with pride. 
if you are willing to come down from that tree, Jesus will take, take the rest of it. He's willing to come in. Let's pray together. Father, for those of us who are Christians, we, we typically make this whole thing of witnessing and sharing much more difficult uh, than it needs be. Um, we don't want to look stupid. We don't want, don't want to look foolish. But we, when we go in that direction, we miss the, the, the most obvious things that we do have already with us. The power of invitation and the power of kindness. And we usually have little idea about how that is felt by somebody who doesn't know you. The power of grace is felt through invitation. The power of grace is felt through kindness, especially when in their mind it's undeserved and unexpected. For for those of us who are already Christians, would you help us to see the two things that you've already placed in us? that we can use this week with people that we know who are lost. Give us wisdom about how to do that. Help us to get outside of ourselves. And then secondly, maybe you're here checking out Christianity and this whole Jesus thing. And maybe in some ways you identify with Zacchaeus. Outwardly, all your friends think you're doing great, but inwardly and inside, it's a different story. A growing sense of emptiness, a growing sense of loneliness, a a growing sense of not really being deeply, meaningfully connected with almost anyone. The problem lies in our sin. And Jesus Christ came to deal with that problem in our hearts. And like Zacchaeus, if you will come down simply from your pride, Jesus will come into your heart and take care of that.